Are we ready to start? Um, I'm ready. All right, I'll start with introductions. Um, I want to welcome everyone to the Snow Hydrology Cyber Seminar Series. Um, and today, you know, we, um, we do not have our originally scheduled speaker, Tim Link, but we are very fortunate to have um, Professor Michael Durand from the School of Earth Sciences at Ohio State University, who um, not only is a great speaker, but also was willing to respond to a frantic email from me Monday morning saying, please, can you prepare a talk at the last minute and be willing to talk this Friday. Um, Mike got his PhD from UCLA, where he was a NASA Earth System Science Fellow. And he um, does work that spreads a lot of different areas, including using different types of remote sensing data, different types of data assimilation, looking at um, not only snow hydrology, but also many aspects of land surface hydrology. Um, and he's going to talk about today um, microwaves and snow grains, building on some of the um, work that Matthew Sturm presented two weeks ago, and on how you can use that to monitor the changing mountain snowpack. So it fits excellent with our series. And thank you very much, um, Mike, for speaking today. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Jessica, for that. And I think it'll hopefully will build well on, on what you presented um, last week as well. So I know um, with probably all of you, I'm really sad to miss Tim Link's talk on vegetation today. I did want to thank Jessica and the organizers of this uh, series for asking me to fill in. <clears throat> so the photo shows um, part of the Yampa River Valley, and where I've done, done some, some work. And you can ask yourself, in this kind of environment, you know, thinking back to Jessica's talk about mountain snow last week, you know, how much SWE is in that picture? <laughs> and uh, it's it's a really, really challenging problem. My approach has been to use satellite measurements in the microwave spectrum to try to address that. And I've been chasing this for, for several years now, and um, this, the, the work I'll be presenting is a, a collaborative result of a number of different people, and I'll, I'll acknowledge them um, throughout. So that's the Yampa. Let's think about the continental US for a second. Snow's critically important. Um, especially mountain snow. There's uh, so, so many communities downstream of mountains that rely on that for their water supply, as have been pointed out in the past couple of, of weeks at the seminars. Here's a, a graph that Don Klein put together a few years ago uh, that shows three different approaches that you might take to try to estimate the total amount of um, snow storage in the, in the continental US on a given year. One of those would be the uh, start from, from land surface models and, and your best in situ measurements and try to merge those. And that's what the SNODAS approach uh, takes. That's that black line there. Um, and then another approach would be using um, the microwave remote sensing, and that's that red line. And you can see that there, you, know, you, you get some of the same patterns in there, the seasonal evolution, but the differences are, are on the order of 30% of the mean there. And Jeff Dozier showed this as well in his uh, EOS um, article that I know many of you have have read there's serious um, uncertainties in estimating large-scale snow water equivalent with our best methods. So what I'm going to talk about is our ways to improve our, uh, our remote sensing estimates. Hmm. So let's talk about uh, microwave measurements um, briefly by way of introduction here. So we have 30 plus years of, of global, nearly global, um, daily or nearly daily and sometimes twice daily measurements uh, that span um, that changes in the Earth system, changes in the snow hydrology um, that we've, we've, um, we all know about. So if we can use these measurements to fully um, be able to characterize snowpack, it would be a, a, an, an amazing, amazing thing. Um, the principle is fairly simple. If you look at the graphic on the right, the land surface is emitting microwaves as well as um, radiation of all wavelengths, of course, but it, it emits enough in the microwave spectrum that we can measure it from space. Snow um, accumulates on top of the land surface and then scatters and absorbs that microwave radiation. And uh, as you get to deeper and deeper snow, you measure less and less microwave radiation from space. Um, so that's the, the basic principle. And there's a number of um, products that are out there using these microwaves for the last 30 years um, to estimate snow water equivalent. 
um, and I'm not going to talk too much about those. The globe snow is one that um, I know has gotten a lot of attention recently. Um, one channel, a little bit about microwave radiation. So we're talking about wavelengths. They're about 8 millimeters, so much, much longer than um, what we're uh, talking about with visible near-infrared. And uh, that corresponds to a frequency of 37 gigahertz. So the, that 37 gigahertz I'll use throughout since it's used in the microwave um, literature and so on, but uh, it just refers to a, a channel of about 8 millimeters um, in wavelength. So if it were as simple as I was showing on that previous slide, um, of course, we'd, the, you know, the, we'd have perfect snore equivalent everywhere. And um, of course, there's a number of issues that have been identified over the last years in microwave remote sensing of snow. So um, one of them is the grain size. So if you look on the figure on the right, that's model results that I um, had from my PhD thesis. So in all of those curves, so that first of all, this is brightness temperature at 37 gigahertz on the y-axis. So brightness temperature is a measure of how much microwave radiation is being emitted by the land surface and, um, and then you know, absorbed and scattered through the snow. So it's a, a measure of the microwave radiation. <coughs> and um, it's expressed in temperature, um, which is, takes a little getting used to. It can be a little counterintuitive. But if you look at those curves, on the x-axis, um, you've got the snow depth increasing from 0 to 2 meters for four different you know, one-layer homogeneous snowpacks. Assume there's no stratigraphy here first. And uh, those four curves represent different grain sizes from 0.75 to 1.5 millimeters. And uh, the long and short of that graph is that if you measured 220 Kelvin's brightness temperature of some landscape, you wouldn't know whether that corresponded to a quarter meter or one and a quarter meters of snow depth. So grain size is a first order determiner of uh, the emitted microwave radiation. And that's an issue that's been worked on a lot. Um, Saturation is also an issue. So you can see that those curves saturate at a certain depth. They stop, you know, the brightness temperature stops decreasing when you increase the snow depth. So we'll hit that a few times through the, through the talk today. And, um, and then there is the issue of stratigraphy. So this is the model results there are assuming a, you know, grain size is the same throughout the snowpack. Of course, grain size tends to increase as you get towards the bottom of the snowpack, and you have all kinds of interesting things going on with uh, melt refreeze crust and depth ore and so on in the mountains. Um, and the, the photo in the middle there is an example of, uh, of a thin section of snow. Um, cut to show the layers. And there's all kinds of layers through there, and those layers are important in the microwave. So these are some of the issues that you have just at a point scale um, with grain size and microwave radiation. And that's the beginning. So then there's a, a few other issues. Um, first couple ones among them are scale and vegetation. So I'm showing that picture on the right there of the Yampa again. Um, and you might fit about one or two microwave footprints. So the pixel size, in other words, would fit uh, one or two pixels over that huge area. Um, so you know, what, what do you do? Obviously, the snow is varying every meter um, in, in that scene. So how do you, uh, is there anything that can be done to, to still use the microwaves in, in such a context? So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then you see a lot of vegetation um, and a lot of trees in graphics. We'll talk about what, the, what that does um, to the microwave. Another way to look at that is the, those two graphics on the left. So the top one is modeled snow water equivalent at 90 meters. And you can see all the, and this is not the AMP anymore. This is the Kern in the southern Sierra Nevada. And you can see all the variability in that um, snow water equivalent. And then those footprints down there show you the the measured microwave gradients at the same day. So we'll talk about the scale and the vegetation as well as the grain size. <coughs> and, and so that's sort of the map of the talk. So the first section, um, spend a few minutes talking about how microwaves interact with snow, progress we've made, um, or that the, the community has made in the last years on, on how that works. Um, then we'll talk about those vegetation and scale issues. And um, we've done a few studies recently to try to show, to characterize the way in which we lose information um, as a function of scale and vegetation. And so we'll, um, I'll present those. And then uh, third, so given 
those first two points, how are we going to finally get a Snower equivalent estimate? All right. So let's start with a let's start with a snowpack. It should should look very familiar um, after uh, Jessica's seminar last week. Um, this is from the Yampa. This is in Colorado. This is from some field work I did with Noam Olich and Ed Kim. So the frame you're seeing there is uh, something we use for near infrared photography to measure snow grain size, which I'll talk about later. Um, so if you can look past the frame or around the frame, um, you've got several different things going on there. There at the base of the snowpack, you can see the little vegetation poking up. And just above that, you've got a uh, melt refreeze um, basal layer. You've got some depth ore above that. Um, after that, you've got some densified snow. And uh, the snow grain size is going to be quite different in all of those layers, starting at the top and going to the bottom. So as one way to get an idea of what the grain size might look like, um, here are some photos, some snow micrographs from uh, uh, Colbeck's work. And so from one to four, those are the kind of classic grain size shapes and uh, morphologies that you might find starting at the top of that snowpack I just showed and then going to the bottom. Um, this is similar to what um, Matthew showed a couple weeks ago. So you start with the um, dendritic forms that still have these um, thin um, pointy <laughs> shapes that look like storybook snowflakes. And that's you know rapidly decomposing dendrites there. It might just be a couple days old. That will gradually metamorphose into these rounded shapes in photograph two. And then in the right conditions uh, where you've got, for instance, a large temperature gradient, um, you can metamorph those along a kinetic metamorphic pathway to the, um, those faceted shapes that are shown in three, um, which is also called depth ore. And then some much larger depth ore crystals uh, is shown in four. And so that might be what you'd find as you go from the top of the snowpack to the bottom. And all of these are important to think about for microwaves, um, as we'll discuss. One issue that we'll talk about is how do you go from things like this to a one grain size measurement. Um, Matthew says, Matthew Stern says sometimes that you know, it's better to think of snow grain size as a distribution of sizes. And you can definitely get uh, see a distribution in, in these photos. But there's also an issue of just what do you measure? Um, if you had a number of different people make different grain size measurements um, from these pictures, you'd probably get different numbers. And that's an issue we'll keep talking about. <clears throat> this is uh, one way that you um, tend to have make grain size measurements in the field, and that's to scrape some snow grains onto a ruled card and then do your best to pick out a representative number um, based on, on the, the, the rule size. And you, know, you, you get differences in different observers. And this is still being debated. I don't know that um, there's necessarily a consensus on a new way to make grain size that everyone in the community agrees with. Um, but because these measurements have tended to be subjective in the past, and because those grain size is so important for the microwave, it, this has been a big issue in microwave science. <clears throat> so what should we be measuring? Well, I want to go back to some um, studies that were done at the University of Bern in Switzerland. Um, in the 80s and 90s, especially in the late 90s, uh, with Andreas Weissman, 98, and, and a couple others. Um, they treated, I, I really like their approach, they treated the microwave being propagated through a homogeneous snow slab as um, a two-flux approximation. So you've got an upward-going microwave flux and a downward-going microwave flux. And the downward is important because the snow begins to emit as well and, and so on, as well as uh, multiple internal reflections. And uh, this gives you a, a pretty straightforward um, you know, two coupled uh, differential equations that you can solve with two boundary conditions. A couple things about this. The gamma s represents the scattering. Gamma a represents the absorption. So the scattering tends to be um, quite a bit larger than the absorption at most of the microwave frequencies that I, I usually work at. And what they did is they also made some really nice uh, structural measurements of the snow microstructure at the same time they were measuring the, uh, the brightness temperature at the top of each slab. And the structural microstructure parameter that they measured was the autocorrelation function of the ice-air matrix. So what does that mean? So if you look at that 
photograph of, of, of Deptor there from the Kohlbeck. Um, imagine you start in one of those uh, ice grains and then um, move away from where you started. And the further you go, the more likely it is that you'll change from ice to air, right? And so the autocorrelation function is not, does not link to snow grains, but it links to the uh, ice-air matrix. So it just treats the, what you see there as a statistical collection of ice and air with, with properties that you can measure um, in terms of the autocorrelation function. And so the correlation length is sort of a, an estimate that would say, by the time you've gone a certain distance, L, you're likely to have changed from ice to air or from air to ice. So for really large uh, coarse grain snow, like Deptor, you might see, um, so here's two measured autocorrelation functions um, that Zoe Corval measured at Krell from some um, uh, samples we made in, in, in the Yampa. And uh, so for that coarse grain, that's the blue line, and, and that shows uh, an autocorrelation function that decays rather slowly, and so that's an autocorrelation length of about 0.2 millimeters. And then that um, fine grain, the green line, uh, decays a lot faster. And that just reflects the increased um, probability that you'll change from ice to air with fine grained snow over shorter distances. Okay, so that's the autocorrelation length, and that's the microstructure that, uh, parameter that it, that's used. And you'll notice a couple things here. You know, even though you have a range of different sizes, you can still calculate the autocorrelation length. And also, it's something that can be um, calculated uh, objectively, although in a laboratory. And and at um, SLF, they're doing a lot of that. A lot of a lot of uh, really excellent work there with Martin Schneebly and, and others. <clears throat> so they then, uh, going back to these burn experiments, they you know, measured the um, autocorrelation length and the scattering coefficient for a bunch of different kinds of snow and found um, you'll see both tr diamonds and triangles on that graph. And so at least for densified snow, it's greater than 200 kilograms per cubic meter. There's a pretty nice um, fit. Um, for the scattering coefficient as a function of correlation length. And so this allows for a, um, an objective basis to their model. So this was, this was a good thing. Um, and the model that they came up with is called MEMLS, the Microwave Emission Model of Layered Snowpack. Uh, once they had that slab model, they combined it into a multi-layer approach, and that um, is a, a graphic from their paper in 1999, uh, Andreas Weissman and Christian Mossler. And uh, other rate of transfer models, such as DMRT, University of Washington, and the Helsinki uh, University of Technology models, both have multi-layer versions as well. Also, I'm going to mostly work with MEMLs um, for the work I'm showing here. And uh, so one question we, we've, we've run into is whether this layering makes a difference. Now we have the tools to evaluate that. So if you've got something like this with, uh, um, you know, highly variable autocorrelation length or, or grain size varying vertically, is that the same as just averaging those grain sizes and, and calculating the microwave radiance from the average? And, and, and not surprisingly, we found it's, it's, uh, it, that those are, those are very different things. OK, let's look at um, some. Uh, so I, I, I grabbed some of the cold land processes experiment data um, to look at some of these ideas and kind of illustrate things um, in a paper I did a few years ago. And so the cold land processes experiment was um, funded by NASA. It finished in um, 2003 and went for a couple years before that for, for two winters mainly. And there's a, a ton of papers out there. I counted uh, 50 or so um, of people that have worked with the CLPX data. So the, there was one place where we made some in situ microwave measurements and in situ uh, snow pits. And, and I, I should clarify, um, those measurements were made. I wasn't actually there. I was taking my qualifying exams at the time. and. Uh, so here's the snow accumulation across um, from the 19th to the 25th of February um, in two snow pits that were very close to the radiometer field of view. And you can see all kinds of things going on here. The blue represents ice layers um, that were flagged in the snow pits. And then the, um, those, uh, those values in millimeters are hand lens grain size measurements. So it's the uh, measurements that were made that were, was the maximum extent of the prevailing grain, as um, was written in the former version of the field handbook. Um, so <clears throat> the question is, how, do we, you know, how well can we start with these, these measurements of the snow um, in the snow pits and relate those to the microwave brightnesses? So first of all, we need some way to go from grain size to correlation length, right? So 
you have these hand lens measurements made as is indicated in the photograph there. And um, then what we need for the microwave is the correlation, correlation length. So um, I, I uh, found a pretty nice relationship between, again, some of the um, measurements made at the University of Bern, University of Bern group. So you have a, um, once you filter for density, if you have um, snow with about greater than 150 kilograms per cubic meter density, you can use this uh, function to map from grain size to correlation length. Now that does not adjust for the issue of observer subjectivity. Um, you get different observers in the field will give you different grain size measurements, but it does at least get you into the right quantity. And um, I was I was real excited when I uh, found that the microwave measurements that uh, that we were simulated um, matched the obser observations pretty nicely, um, with some caveats. So, take a look at what's going on here. There's the top figure is 19 gigahertz. That's one microwave channel, and then the bottom is 36 and a half gigahertz, which is the microwave channel I, I mostly focus on. So let's just look at the bottom graph here. Um, then you've got two other things going on. You've got vertical polarization, which is in blue, and then horizontal polarization, which is in red. And those are um, just radiation polarized in, in, in two, different, two different orientations. Okay? And that's, those are the two kinds of microwave measurements that we have from satellite. So at vertical polarization, we were doing really nicely. We had you know, about a little under 10 Kelvin of, of, uh, of RMS air um, for, those blue, for those blue solid symbols compared to the open ones. Um, so I was really excited about that. Horizontal ones did not look nearly as good. We did well on some days and poorly on others. And so we tried to figure out why that was. We um, did a first order uncertainty analysis using air propagation and so on. And the results of that were um, that at 19, well, at, for both 19 and 37 gigahertz, um, the ice layers, the, the stratigraphy, were really, really important in dominating our air analysis. So the ice layers and stratigraphy co control the accuracy at the horizontal polarization. Um, and the re one of the reasons for that is it's very difficult to get measurements of ice layer density. And so it's not, they're not measured. They weren't measured at CLPX anyway. So we were just guessing what those ice layer densities were. And so we had a very high uncertainty there. And then um, the next big uh, player in the room, perhaps not surprisingly, was the grain size fit, so that log function that I showed um, a couple slides ago that we derived between correlation length and the hand lens grain size. And so that was the second most important um, error source. Um, so some of the next steps were um, clearly, you know, there's, there's a number of new grain size measurement techniques. So um, Tom, Tom Painter has developed this. Uh, method contact spectroscopy. I know his, his student Mackenzie Skiles has done a lot with that. Um, and here's a picture actually of Noah Malich, um illustrating how the contact spectroscopy worked. Um, there's also a near-infrared camera. There's several objective ways of, of measuring snow grain size. I'm not going to do a, a full review of those today. Um, but we managed um, to get out into the field and sort of repeat part of the uh, CLPX and C2 microwave experiment. Ed Kim provided the radiometer, which is that big gray box in the photo. And I'm sort of standing there in the background looking at the uh, brightness temperature. Um, and so the question was, with these objective grain size measurements, are we doing better? You know, does that link better into, uh, into, the, um, into the microwave? So a few things. Uh, measuring the autocorrelation length is not trivial. This is what we did. Um, on the bottom left there is a picture of Ed making snow casts. So you cut out a uh, section of snow with, from a snow pit with a saw. Um, you put it into, in this case, Chinese takeout containers. And uh, then you fill um, up all the airspace in that container with a uh, casting agent. So in this case, we're using dimethyl phthalate. And then at Krell, these um, Zoe Corville um, um, cut and uh, photographed the um, ice air matrix. So that top photograph is um, the black are the ice grains, and then the gray is the dimethyl phthalate. And there's sort of a, a paradox why the snow grains end up showing up darker than the dimethyl. I can um, talk about that if anyone's interested. But the main thing is you get the ice air uh, matrix out of this. And then you take the auto, you calculate the empirical autocorrelation function from the images. What you do is you, you cast it in the field, then you send it to the lab, and then you section 20 times and photo, make photos of each of those 20 
sections, then you calculate the autocorrelation function. <laughs> so several steps, significant resources involved, and um, it's, uh, it's pretty resource intensive. Um, and then so those gray lines are 20 different correlation lengths derived from 20 photos from a single ice uh, or a single snow uh, sample. And the black and red are the uh, uh, exponential fit and the empirical, um, respectively. We also did some um, near-infrared camera measurements, which um, a method developed by um, Margaret Motzel and, and Martin Schneebly, an SLF. And uh, <clears throat> so that allows you to measure the specific surface area, which you can then convert to the correlation length and push into the microwave models. So operating on a fairly small sample size, admittedly here, um, we were pretty happy with the results. So first of all, we averaged all of our um, results into a single layer, and you end up getting errors on the order of about 30 Kelvin, um, which is which is quite quite significant. And so that's a kind of warning um, that when you have a lot of layers in these, in these kind of snowpacks, you have to use a, uh, a multi-layer model. The hand lens grain size, we may measure those as well. And we we're about 10, 12 Kelvin for the uh, for the final error on those. And then the new methods, stereology and near infrared camera, we were less than 10, more like uh, 7 um, or 5 Kelvin errors for those. So that was that was really encouraging. Um, I'm uh, running a little long here. I'm going to skip over um, some of these things we've um, by collaborating with other others in um, various places. So there was a similar experiment done, Nostrex um, in Finland. We're able to show that using the um, seven layer, a seven layer version of MEMLs mm -hmm. and the uh, micro CT um, derived um, snow structure, we're able to get good brightness temperature simulations and so on. So there's a number of remaining issues. So we need more. You know, the measuring a, the autocorrelation function in a lab is is very resource intensive, and we need new methods of measuring correlation length in the field. There's many of those being developed, um, and then simultaneous TB measurements. There's just not that many data sets where all of those are available together. So um, there's a lot of work going on uh, in the Snow Grain Size Working Group. This is a meeting from uh, last year in uh, Grenoble, uh, France, and a bunch of uh, different grain size measurements were, were compared. And there's a follow-up meeting um, for a more rigorous comparison of those grain size measurements um, uh, later this year, as well as a microwave-related um, measurement in the same community uh, led by Mel Sandels. So that's all, those are all exciting things to look forward to. So we're starting to understand a little bit more about how microwaves interact with snow. So let's look at the scale and vegetation issues. Um, Kind of as a reminder, although I'm, sh I'm sure no one ha has has forgotten, you know, you you have snow spatial variability, especially in mountainous terrain. That's just every every meter or or less, you can get serious changes in snow depth. You can see the tree and the spatial variability near the tree here um, on the on the uh, right side of that photo. And um, looking again at these uh, simulated 90 meter SWE, um, you have seriously serious. serious uh, variations in that snow water equivalent. And uh, those microwave footprints that are shown below are much larger than that. So what do we do? So I thought to try to phrase the question is, how does the sensitivity of brightness temperature to snow, especially snow water equivalent, things we're interested in, change as a function of the observation resolution? So if you were to start at the point scale, and then you go all the way up to the passive microwave scale, these are those ellipses are about 100 square kilometers in size, um, where do you start losing information and how? And uh, what, what I wanted to do is focus on, you know, obviously with a coarse measurement, you can't recover the subgrid variations except, you know, with a model or something that's not an observation. Um, but maybe you could get the average snow water equivalent within that large measurement. Even that, you know, coarse snow water equivalent would be really nice to know, and we'd be able to, um, to move forward in that direction. So that was the approach we were taking on the scale issue. So, um, Again, we used some CLPX measurements. Um, there was a number of airborne flights <coughs> um, of airborne passive microwave brightness temperatures that were collected, and then intensive ground measurements on um, taken coincident. So the airborne microwave measurements have footprints of more like 100 square meters, or I'm sorry, um, 100, 100, uh, 100 meter diameters, really. And um, that's, a, that's a bit of a typo there. And um, then we had uh, coincident LIDAR 
snow depths as well as uh, snow pits. So um, if you look at the top figure on the right, those, that shows a square kilometer intensive study area that's Fraser Alpine. And there is um, on the order of 20 snow pits made in um, that ISA. You can see the complex terrain. And here we've got you know, vegetation dominating one, one part of the, uh, the area. And then the other is, is kind of windswept and, and has a lot less trees. There were intense uh, snow depth transects that were also made. So those are shown in the bottom picture. The, the sample pattern for the snow depth transects are in blue. And then uh, the cyan circles show the microwave um, sampling that we got from the airplane. Here's the uh, measured stratigraphy of those different snow pits. You can see a lot of variability. So the scales are the same. The y-axes are the same on each of those. And what I'm showing is grain size on the x-axis and um, and the layer thickness or layer uh, depth on, on the y-axis. And this is some work that um, Ben Vanderjack did. So uh, you can see that in, in many of these cases, you have larger grain size on the bottom and smaller on the top, as, as predicted. But the depth variation is huge. So there's, you, you range from 5 centimeters to 150 centimeters. And um, we first compared our brightness simulation. So first we got, um, I should say, in order to make the snow depth spatially continuous, we um, got LIDAR depth that uh, James McCray had created from the, um, from the LIDAR uh, snow depth measurements that were made coincidence, coincident. And then we uh, use that as uh, inputs into the MEMLS model using um, constrained by the, the snow grain size measurements that were made at the snow pits. Um, so the top picture, figure on the right there is the actual measurements. You can see the kind of uh, chaotic pattern based on where the conical, uh, conical scanning radiometer was pointed uh, when it flew over Fraser Alpine. And then on the bottom is the modeled result at 10 meter resolution. So you can see there's fairly good um, um, spatial patterns. There's some mismatch in, um, uh, that we think is due to the, the spatial registration of those microwave footprints. And uh, the modeled and um, measured um, box plots are shown there on the left for comparison. So this is one ISA. We looked at four ISAs in this, um, in this paper that Ben, ben did. And uh, <clears throat> in the others, we, we, we were also getting the mean value right. And um, the range was a little bit off in the model for the ISAs with higher vegetation. Um, the idea, here's the snow, the snow depth um, maps we got from, from, from James McRae. And uh, we just literally scaled that. You know, we just said, OK, um, let's take that snow depth um, map. These are uh, units of meters. So they're max size, but two meters there on the left. And let's just cut it by you know, half and a quarter and see how that changes the brightness. So that was the uh, first step here. And as we reduce the average SWE over the ISA, over the area, we still have a pretty well-behaved um, brightness temperature sensitivity to the um, average snow in the ISA. And so this is really good. And these, are, these are four different ISAs, all one square kilometer. Um, now, this was neglecting vegetation. We'll talk more about vegetation here in a minute. But just in terms of the average snow, we're, even despite all the spatial variability of snow depth and the spatial variability of grain size, you still have some um, sensitivity to snow depth that does saturate at higher depths, but still um, you, you, have, you have some nice sensitivity and it's fairly well behaved. So then the next question is, OK, what happens if you sample that 10 meter grid we had with successively coarser observations? So what we did is we um, started with a 100 meter uh, measurement footprint, which was corresponding to what you can get from airborne. And then we um, artificially coarsened that. And then we compared the brightness temperature and the mean snow depth, again, for these same ISAs. And what you see in all of these figures is that you don't see a huge change in that sensitivity. You're still you know, decreasing the snow depth in a fairly well-behaved way as a function of coarsening those measurements pretty dramatically by an order of magnitude. Um, so I, the scale problem itself, I don't think, is, is, a, is a fundamental killer of the information about the average SWE um, within microwave footprints. There are other things that are, that are challenging. Um, so again, the, the main thing we are shooting at there, the main thing we, we feel like we showed, was that the, the, the spatial heterogeneity itself does not reduce your sensitivity to the average snow equivalent within the footprint. 
However, vegetation is a, uh, is a major problem. This has been shown s several times in several different ways. Um, I know Marco Tedesco, for instance, has a, has a nice paper on this um, several years ago using the CLPX data. Um, what we wanted to do was say, OK, we know that vegetation starts to mask out the microwave measurements. And so if the trees are thick enough, you don't, all you see is trees, and you don't see the snow underneath them anymore. So what we wanted to do is try to figure out um, where is the cutoff? Is there some vegetation metric we can use to try to predict how, how thick of trees we can see under? So um, what Ben did, and this is um, something that's currently in, in preparation, um, is to look at both spaceborne borne AMSRE measurements, as well as airborne PSR measurements from the uh, CLPX over several large river basins in Colorado. Um, this is the upper Colorado um, here. And then um, just he found a way to parameterize the uh, transmissivity of the canopy as a function of the leaf area index. And then he made masks that are like what's shown on the left there below of where you probably can see through the trees and where you probably can't. And that probably has a star on it. We'll come back to it. <coughs> so um, here are uh, seven river basins in, in the Colorado and how much of the total snow accumulation we think we can see beneath them at airborne scales and satellite scales. Um, we estimated the total amount of snow equivalent in these footprints using SNODAS. And um, at airborne, which are those light blue bars on the right, airborne scales, we're able to see um, a, a lot of the snow water equivalent accumulation. So looking on the left at Yampa, where those photos are I showed before, um, we think we can see nearly 90% of the snow water equivalent accumulation in, 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 in the Yampa um, using airborne. At, using spaceborne, which are the dark bars, the picture is not as positive. So now we're at above 50%, but not much above 50%. Um, so vegetation is um, the thing that I'm most worried about in uh, going forward. And the big question then becomes, like, well, what is the right vegetation metric to use? LAI is, has its own problems. And then what's the max value of LAI for which we can see SWE? Um, I hear some other people talking in the background. I don't know if they, they can maybe mute their phone or. Um, but I'm, I'm going to go go ahead. OK, so that's the, uh, what we've done so far on the vegetation and scale issues. And, and there's a lot of other uh, really, really nice work on these. Um, the vegetation in particular, Alex Langlaw at uh, Sherbrooke has done some really nice work. OK, so then the next question is, uh, given what we've learned about scale and vegetation, um, what's a, a method or a system that we can use to estimate snow water equivalent from satellite observations. Um, is, there, is there a question from someone? the first floor for regular classes. Yeah. So maybe if, you, if you're still talking to you, don't mind muting your phone. That would be great. OK. So let's look at some um, space-borne microwave brightness temperatures uh, over, the, over the Sierra Nevada. So here's just a. Um, kind of a, a day in early accumulation season. Um, and the microwave uh, measurements show this pretty significant decrease over the, over the Sierra, and that's due to the scattering based on by the snow. But how do we pull that um, signal out? Before we go there, what I wanted to do is um, first just uh, correlate real briefly some of the microwave brightness temperature metrics with uh, snow pillows on the ground in the, in the southern Sierra. And uh, this is work that. Uh, Dong Yue Li did, <coughs> and uh, there's, his, his paper is in uh, RSE in 2012. So we're looking at the Kern River in the uh, southern Sierra. So it's the uh, you can see it there in the in, in the bottom figure on the right. You've got um, a lot of complex terrain. You have high elevations, um, and there are there is some places that in the domain that are relatively above tree line that still are big enough to uh, have microwave footprints in them. So what we wanted to do is look at how well um, the, the AMSRI measurements correlate with uh, the uh, snow pillow measurements at the um, red squares shown there. A little bit about AMSRI. So AMSRI is, is a conical scanning radiometer. Um, and it's always spinning around. And because it's always spinning around um, and because it's uh, repeat orbit is about 14 days, and it, it has different measurement uh, geometry 
with respect to a ground location throughout its, um, throughout its cycle. So what that means for us on the ground trying to use the data, if you look at that picture on the, on the right, the graphic on the right, is that the footprints are constantly changing in their orientation. So your, your, the footprints are ellipses. Um, these measurements are often average to the easy grid, which is 25 kilometers. These footprints are the native um, spot size on, on the ground, um, the L2A, um, M3 brightness temperature measurements at 37 gigahertz. And uh, <coughs> they, are, they have a, a, an area, each ellipse has an area of about 100 square kilometers, which is you know, a factor of six less than, than what we, we typically use with the easy grid. So what we did is we picked out the minimum brightness temperature for each, uh, for each of uh, six years. For, and then we, um, well, let me, let me first say how, what we did here. So we averaged the, um, the brightness temperature over, over the, the watershed by doing just a, a weighted average of how much each footprint overlaps with the watershed area. And then we averaged all the snow pillows together. So we have a, an upper Kern basin sweep from those very limited snow equivalent measurements. This is probably not reflective of the actual SWE in the basin, but it's in terms of a mean, um, so it's probably biased, but it also rep does represent um, the annual patterns in terms of the x-axis there. On the y-axis, we're showing the average brightness temperatures averaged by um, uh, the, the, the footprints and the watershed there. So what we've got is um, uh, a pretty nice correlation if we use either the easy grid at 625 square kilometers or, or the uh, footprints. Um, but what you see is that you have about three times more signal. So you drop 15 Kelvin um, for that same, over that same uh, range of snow equivalent for the footprint averages, and you only drop about 5 Kelvin for the easy grid. So the easy grid being resampled has um, uh, just averaged out some of the uh, information that we thought, think was, was originally in those um, lower level brightness temperatures. And I'm running out of time, so I'll move on. Um, this was, I just want to, as a final note here, we did look at a few other basins and um, found similar uh, uh, correlations between the minimum brightness temperature and the SWE with the, with the uh, caveat that it was a fairly unvegetated part of the basin. So how do you get that information out? How do you invert that, um, the, the information that we think is there about the snow water equivalent in the brightness temperature and, uh, and get a final estimate of snow water equivalent that reflects the snow water equivalent, um, that reflects the, the passive microwave? So this is a data, a, a data simulation framework. I'm not going to go into any detail at all except to say what we do is we um, run a land surface model, a snow model that dynamically keeps track of the snowpack, the grain size, and so on. Um, and then we compare that high resolution um, estimate of the snow water equivalent. So the prior is our first guess based on the land model of snow water equivalent and grain size and so on. And we use that microwave model MEMLs to map the prior estimates um, into the measurement space. Then we use the actual measurements um, based on dynamic, empirically derived correlations um, between, um, uh, based on the models uh, to, to map the measurements back into an update to change the original first guess of the snow water equivalent. We first, um, I, I, for my thesis, I showed that this should work in theory um, with synthetic measurements. Um, I'll show you just two um, uh, cases with using real measurements here. So the first was again at CLPX for the um, local scale observation site for, near Fraser, and uh, we have those same two snow pits and the same microwave measurements that I showed in the previous study were used in the data simulation here. And um, just to kind of cut to the chase here, so the dashed line on the left is the prior first guess of snow depth. Um, there was some bias in the precipitation, but this is actually due to uh, the reason that it's so low uh, compared to the measurements, which are those circles the blue circles. The reason that we're so low is that the snowpack um, in the model we were using melted out too soon in the beginning of the season. So anyway, um, then we assimilated the microwave brightness temperatures, and then we got the posterior or the um, estimate of snow equivalent that we wanted from our data simulation. That matched the um, snow depth observations from the snow pits really nicely. So the depth is greater than a meter here, so pretty deep. Um, and our bias uh, in, in terms of the snow depth estimate was uh, uh, just seven centimeters. So we're really, really happy about this. This is really, really exciting. And it showed that uh, the, this kind of data simulation system can work at a point scale. But what about basins, right? So going back to the Kern, um, this is also work that uh, 
Dong Yue Lee has, has been working on, and it's still in progress. And the, uh, we, we start with NLDAS, um, uh, precipitation, and other, other four things, NLDAS 2, actually. These are disaggregated using a scheme developed by uh, Manuela Giroto and Steve Margolis at UCLA um, to 90 meters. And then we take that high-resolution snow water equivalent, map it to a, a high-resolution brightness temperature, which is shown on the top right. And that's brightness temperature at 37 gigahertz, vertical polarization from 220 to 250 Kelvin. You can see that the spatial vari variability that that um, downscaling scheme introduced into the snow water equivalent estimates is still present in the microwave. And um, then what we do on the bottom row there. On the left is the AMSR E brightness temperature observation, so those 100 square kilometer footprints. And then on the right is the model version of the AMSR by taking the top right, the high resolution brightness temperature, and then coarsening it to the same footprint pattern that AMSR E actually observed. So now we can take the difference of those two brightness temperatures and map that difference back into update the snow water equivalent. And so here are the results um, that I'm showing you today. This is for water year 2004. And um, the red line is the first guess. Oh, I, I, I left off the legend. I'm sorry. So the red line is the first guess. The blue is the snow pillow snow equivalent. And then that green line is the posterior or the um, data simulation estimates. We're able to um, move that snow water equivalent estimate closer to the snow pillow in, in all those cases. And uh, this, is, this is preliminary, and this is a good year. Um, I'm not going to show the bad year. <laughs> and uh, we're still working on sorting out all the technical issues with this. But this is where we're trying to go. Um, it's comp the remaining issues with, with this uh, assimilation, it's computationally expensive. Um, modeling grain size is, is definitely non-trivial. There's some really nice new grain size models out there, such as the one developed by Mark Flanner at University of Michigan and, and others. Um, it's hard to track the uh, covariance, the relationship between the brightness temperature and the SWE through all the different um, snowfall events and so on. So these are some of the issues we're working through. Okay, so just to summarize, um, in terms of uh, how microbes interact with snow, it's pretty complex. The stratigraphy, the layering, the grain size, and the correlation le length are all key. Um, and this has been shown in, in a number of studies. So I know Costa Sundriatis has a nice assimilation study out that, that, um, that shows um, that as well. Um, scale and vegetation issues, are those tractable? So I, I think that the scale one is, and we're still very sensitive to the average depth in the footprints. Um, despite all the, the spatial heterogeneity, uh, the problem is the vegetation. And the vegetation masks some SWE, how much we're um, trying to, to quantify that. And then finally, how can we extract the information on snow equivalent brightnesses? And I think this high resolution modeling everything at 90 meters um, and then data simulation provide a path forward. So just want to acknowledge um, those who've contributed to the talk uh, as well as um, sources of funding. Thanks. So I believe, Chris, you're going to lead Q&A. Oh, yep, that's correct. So uh, it looks like Ned Bear has a, a question in there. Um, so can you speak to why many of these algorithms focus on the brightness temperature and snow depth relationship rather than the brightness temperature and SWE relationship? <coughs> yeah, um, let's see. Because I think the main concern there is, isn't the water the attenuator and not yeah no it, it, it's a great point so let me let me answer let me give you two two things here so first of all what we do in in our approach I've sometimes shown depth but I estimate depth and density together you know the microwave measurements are sensitive to both the depth and the density and so I've kind of skimmed over how the assimilation works. So we estimate both the total depth and the density profile, um, starting with the prior and then update it in the posterior. So we are trying our best to keep everything as physically based as possible. And it is the, um, the, the, the depth and the density respond a little bit differently to brightness. So I think it's not quite as simple as to say that the water is the, attenu the t attenuator. You could imagine that it's the number of snow grains that a uh, you encounter along a path length through from the soil to the um, from the soil to the observation. Um, 
Now, I think there are, with the large-scale algorithms, so that's, my, that's, how I, that's how I do stuff. The large-scale algorithms, I'm not the best person to speak to that. Um, I haven't um, developed those or worked with those. I understand that there are largely um, um, uh, issues of, of, of um, convenience and issues of, uh, of how to best relate the um, uh, measurements and the model that are often used behind those algorithms. So um, I know like in, in, in some of Richard Kelly's papers, he discusses uh, what's going on with that and probably speaks to that a little better than I can. All right, and if, if folks could uh, type in some questions, that'd be great. OK, uh, another one, uh, Scotty Strachan. Uh, do you foresee a purely remote sensing solution to sweet conditions, or instead a combination of in situ snow and atmospheric data being coupled with microwave data to improve sweet assessments on a basin by basin basis? So, yeah, so I think definitely the combination. Um, I'm all for combining as many uh, sources of information as is is um, is practicable, and um, it's uh, it's a challenge working with many, many data streams at once. And so I think that the practical issues tend to um, tend to hold things back. So what we were just showing before was NLDAS. So um, you have forcing data for the um, snow models that's, that's uh, generated by our analyses and other um, C2 methods and so on. And uh, I have not yet gotten to the point of assimilating both microwave and uh, snow pillow, for example, but I think it would be something I've been wanting to, to, to work on. I know others have, have been. Okay, a question from Laura Hinkleman. Uh, you showed a relationship between spatial autocorrelation and scattering coefficients, and then a relationship between grain size and autocorrelation. So can't you just skip over the autocorrelation part? Why couldn't uh, good relationships be found between grain size and radiative properties in the first place? That's a great question. Um, I. The, the whole reason for using grain size in the studies that, that I showed was that that's what we had. You know, I, 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 um, there's a, a range of different opinions on, on what to do with hand lens measurements, and I know that some, um, yeah, there, there's a range of opinions. So I, I know that many people feel that it's hard to um, have hand lens grain size measurements that are fully consistent from one observer to the next. Um, you just your eye is drawn to different things and and so on. So, you know, going back to work with the older um, Hanlon's grain size measurements was because that's what we had in that particular study. So I was that was a sort of stopgap to use the the Hanlon's um, measurements, or at least that's what I was thinking about. I, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> um, I I think that the 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 nice thing with the um, correlation length is it can be calculated. Objectively, obviously, the, the tough thing is that it, you need lab work in order to do it. And then the final thing is that people are working on um, ways of, of estimating a proxy, this uh, snow-specific surface area that can be used to convert to the correlation length. There is a follow-on uh, uh, from Laura as well. Um, but in the end, won't you only have grain size? <laughs> what do you <laughs> um, I, if you mean grain size measured by a hand lens, I think that there are people working on field measurements of, uh, you know, based on um, near infrared reflectance and near infrared, uh, uh, both both active and passive near infrared reflectance that are trying to get an obje objective measurement of grain size in the field. So you'll have something maybe more than just the um, more than just the uh, grain size uh, measured with a hand lens. So that's where I think that snow grain size working group is going. OK, so uh, from Krista peters Lazard, uh, what is the reference uh, for the downscaled NLDOS forcings? And do you deal with wind and long waves? Um, so Manuela Giotto is a great person to talk to about that. And I, I believe she's uh, doing a postdoc there, there at Goddard. So um, in my understanding, long wave is dealt with, and I don't remember about wind, um, but I can send you the reference, Krista. 
Um, yeah, so far, that's it. Um, I, I had a question about like a scaling. Um, uh -huh. Like a, so, when you're dealing with satellite imagery, it's like 25 kilometers. Is there some other way to get down like a higher resolution, like you were, were with the aircraft, to somehow improve that? I mean, is there a way to subscale this data set? You, well, from from purely measurement, um, I think you are limited by physical constraints of like antenna size and other things of what you can put into space. I don't think you can push the microwave down to these really high resolutions from space. Um, the Earth just emits uh, relatively low levels of, of microwave radiation, and so you have to integrate over a large area to get a precise measurement. Um, I believe that I've heard of some people working on ways to you know, try to get the last few improvements on, on, on resolution. But um, anyway. Um, the only other way I can imagine to downscale the brightness really is what we're doing now, which is modeling what we where we think the brightness temperature variations are. So you've got, you know, in the um, Kern that we showed earlier, you've got, you know, lower accumulation, warmer temperatures at lower elevations, and we kind of can take that as a as a uh, assumption in in our models, and then use the simulation framework to effectively downscale the microwaves. That, that's where I want to go with it. Chris, but if you've got ideas on how to get around it, um, I'd love to to hear about it. So I've just heard uh, that attempt. And along that line, actually, um, so Jessica Lundquist um, asks, uh, for your current study, the raw data looked like it had a lot more information about the easy grid. Um, is that what Mary Jo is doing? And Mary Jo was talking about um, we're working with image reconstruction techniques to enhance resolution in microwaves. So, so that's that, that's fantastic, and it'll be great to see those project products um, when they when they roll out. So I'm really excited to hear about that. Okay, and then a, a follow up from uh, Scotty. Um, I'm sorry if I'm massacring the last name. Strachan or uh, Strachan uh, of the University of Nevada. Mike, to follow up, what sort of automated measurements besides mass of snow or snow processes do you see as being most useful to improving microwave measurements within individual basins? <clears throat> um, if, that's, a, that's a great question. I think that um, in, in theory, anything you have will help to constrain your uncertainties. You know, if you were to, for instance, later, if we if we were to, um, in the simulation study, it shouldn't occur, and if you were to simulate those snow pillows, you should also, you know, and, and update the snow equivalent in those grid cells, you should also do better. And so I would, I would think that anything else you had would also help. Now, um, if, you know, uh, so, 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 you know, the, the, the LIDAR work that's, that, um, the Airborne Snow Observatory and Tom Painter is working on that gives you almost a direct measurement of the snow equivalent and uh, uh, once you model the density. And so you, know, you can imagine data simulation systems being used to, to merge all kinds, of, all kinds of information. But I think if you want mass, then measurements of mass are the, are the, are the best. I haven't worked so much with, um, for instance, gamma, but I know that Norris uses them in SNODAS. So um, I think using, you know, you could also very easily assimilate those into um, one of these data simulation systems. All right. I, I don't see any other questions. Um, All right. That's it. Thanks right. a lot, Mike. Thank you, and thanks again to uh, Jessica and the organizers for the invite, and uh, appreciate everyone dialing in. Thank you so much, and I want to just um, remind everyone we do not have a talk next Friday, but if you come back two Fridays from today, we will have um, David Robinson talking about snow cover over the globe. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica.